Hey everyone, I am Ms. Hu, your physics teacher. In this video, we're going to go through vector diagrams. So what we'll focus on specifically is using vector diagrams to solve vector problems using two different methods, by scale diagram and by calculations. This particular video will be focusing on vectors that are acting at right angles. So for this, we're going to use an example of two forces acting at right angles to each other. The problem we're going to solve here is to determine the magnitude and direction of the resultant force. The two methods we're going to use are by scale diagram and by calculation. Now, before we move on, I'd just like to share with you that I do have a video of a scale diagram method where I actually draw on paper with a pencil an actual scale diagram, and you can follow that video step by step to see how to actually use a pencil and your ruler and protractor to draw out that scale diagram to solve the question. However, if you'd like to find out just in general how to use a scale diagram, you can stay on this video. So now, Let's start with the first method of the scale diagram. If there are two forces in the question, you have the option of using the rectangle method or a triangle method. I will explain both. Let's start first with the rectangle method. Now, if you'd like to use the rectangle method, you would need to draw the two forces. Normally, the question would provide you with a grid. Now, if the question doesn't have the grid paper, it would then have a blank space instead. So in that blank space, you need to use your ruler to measure out the length to represent the force. Whether you're using the grid or whether you're drawing in a blank space, you would have to follow the scale. Let's say in this particular question, the scale used is 1 cm to 10 newton. In this grid, let's assume that every one unit of the grid is 1 cm. So first of all, draw the two forces in the grid or the space provided by following the original directions of each force and follow the scale when drawing this out. The rectangle method would require both forces to start from the same point, as you can see in the diagram here on the left. So for 15 Newton, you would need to draw an arrow to the right that is 5 centimeters long. For the 80 Newton force, because it's acting upwards, you would need to draw an arrow pointing upwards that's 8 centimeters long. For the rectangle method, what you would need to do is you would need to complete the parallelogram, which in this case is a rectangle, by drawing lines on the opposite sides with the same length. This would then form a rectangle. Now, please note that the opposite sides that you draw must be dotted. That's because the solid arrows that you draw, that means a continuous line of that arrow, is only for the actual forces that are acting on the object. Because we're adding on lines to make a rectangle, those lines are guidelines. Hence, those guidelines must be dotted. Next, we want to determine the resultant force. In this case, the resultant force is basically the single force that is the combination of these two forces acting on that object. Logically, if you think about it, you've got one force pulling upwards and one force pulling to the right. Where would that object move? That's right, it's going to move in between those two forces. So the resultant force would be from corner to corner. That's the resultant force, as you can see in this diagram. So to obtain the answer, you need to draw an arrow from the starting point of both arrows all the way to the opposite intersection, as shown. Now that we have our resultant force, how do we get the values? So first of all, let's find out how to obtain the magnitude of the resultant force. Because this is a scale diagram where you've drawn everything to scale, where we have drawn the 15 Newton and 18 Newton based on the scale provided, to obtain the magnitude of the resultant force, all you need to do is take your ruler and measure the length of the resultant force. Once you have that length, use the scale to convert that length value into the force value in Newton. So for example, let's say we've drawn this out and when we measure the length, we get 9.4 centimeters. Based on the scale, this means that the force value is 94 Newton. 
Now remember that force is a vector, and vectors have both magnitude and direction, which means that we also need to determine the direction in which this resultant force is acting. How do we do that? We would measure the angle by taking a protractor. So to get the direction, we will measure the angle between the resultant force and one of the original force lines. Usually, the question would specify which force line would be our base in which to measure the angle from. In this case, let's say for example, we want to measure the angle between the resultant force and the 50 Newton horizontal line. So using your protractor, place it on the diagram and measure the angle out. In this case, using the protractor, we have found an angle to be 58 degrees. And that's how we can use a rectangle method to determine the resultant force of these two forces. There's also the option of using a triangle instead. Now, when using the triangle method, what we would do is to draw those two forces out the same way, whether it's on a grid or in a blank space provided, we would still need to draw this to scale. The difference is that the forces are drawn one after the other. They do not start at the same point. So for example, we would draw the 50 Newton force to the right. And on the tip of that 50 Newton force, we draw the next force, which is the 80 Newton force upwards. By the way, in case you were wondering if you could start with the 80 Newton force instead, yes, you can. You can also start with the 80 Newton force upward first, and then follow that with the 50 Newton force to the right you would still get the same answer. So let's come back to this example. To obtain the resultant force, all you need to do is just draw an arrow from the start to end. That would be the resultant force. The difference here is that in this particular method, there is a clear starting point and a clear ending point. The resultant force will be from that start to that end. In order to obtain the magnitude and direction, it will be exactly the same. You would also measure out the magnitude with a ruler and use the scale to convert that value back into force. And to obtain the direction, just use a protractor. The values you get should be exactly the same. There's no reason why you should get different values, right? It's because these are just different methods to obtain the answer. Obviously, there's only one set of answers. That's why, regardless of whichever method you use, you would still get the same values. So as a quick recap, you have the option of using the rectangle method or the triangle method. Please be very clear about the difference between these two methods. For the rectangle method, both forces start from the same point and the arrow goes from middle to middle. The triangle method, on the other hand, have the forces going consecutive one after the other. The arrow goes from start to end. Now, if you have to use the scale diagram method, I suggest you focus on one method. If you find that the rectangle method makes more sense to you, then you focus only on the rectangle method. When you practice all the questions, just practice only with the rectangle method. Remember, the two forces start from the same point and the resultant force is from middle to middle. If you prefer the triangle method, then make sure you practice exclusively using the triangle method. That means you start with one force, at the tip of that arrow, draw the next force, and your resultant force is from start to end. I'll just go through a common mistake that happens among students. A common mistake that happens is that students start off with the rectangle method, but then try to finish it up with a triangle method. So, for example, you can see here, the 50 Newton and 80 Newton forces both start from the same point. That's a rectangle method. But then the students get lazy along the way and like, oh, I don't want to draw the rectangle. So they just create a triangle here because, hey, that's a hypotenuse, right? So they draw a random resultant force starting from one random point ending on another random point. If you look at this, can you see that's obviously wrong? In this case, we've got a resultant force starting from the tip of one force, ending on the tip of the other force. Like, how would you know whether the force is moving up, down, left, right? This is completely wrong, right? There's no clear start, no clear end. So be very clear about which method you want to use, whether it's a rectangle or triangle, and avoid making this mistake. Now, let's go through the calculation method. 
When solving by calculations, we can also use the rectangle or triangle method. We would still have to do a quick sketch out in order to be able to calculate the value out. The difference here is that the drawings do not have to be to scale. So before doing the calculations, we still have to do a brief sketch, except that the drawings do not have to be scale. Just draw the forces in the correct original directions, determine where the resultant force is, and from those diagrams, we can obtain our answers. Let's say we use a rectangle method. So you can see here, this looks just like the scale diagram, except that we don't have to draw this to scale. So to calculate the magnitude of the resultant force out, you can see that the resultant force kind of makes a triangle between one of the dotted lines and one of the force lines. So the resultant force here is the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle. And by using the Pythagoras theorem, we can calculate the magnitude of the resultant force. And as you can see, the value here is the same as what you'd have obtained in the scale diagram method. To obtain the direction, which is the angle between the resultant force and one of the force lines, you can't measure it out with the protractor because we didn't draw this to scale, right? That means we need to calculate it out. How do we do that? Trigonometry. So we would use tangent to determine the angle between the resultant force and the 50 Newton line. And you can see from here, we can calculate this out and the value obtained is 58 degrees, similar to the scale diagram method. Remember what I said earlier, it doesn't matter what method you use, there's only one set of correct answers. This is by using the rectangle method to obtain the values through calculations. You can also use calculations on a triangle method. So similarly, we have the triangle here, just that it's not drawn to scale. To obtain the resultant force, just use Pythagoras theorem. And to get the angle, just use trigonometry, which in this case, the tangents calculation. And that's for vector diagrams. The solution methods shared in this video can be used to solve any two vectors acting at right angles. And if you know about vectors, you know there are actually a lot of vectors. However, for IGCSE, you only need to focus on force and velocity. Now, if you've noticed, we've only focused on vectors acting at right angles. Any problem involving angles that are not 90 degrees to each other are not covered in your IGCSE syllabus. However, if you're interested to know how to solve those questions, please watch my video where I cover how to solve problems for two forces acting at angles that are not 90 degrees. To finish up, I suggest you challenge yourself by solving this problem. A parachutist is falling straight down at a constant velocity of 1.5 meters per second. The wind blows him from left to right at a constant velocity of 1.2 meters per second. Based on those values, determine the following. A, the resultant velocity of the parachutist, and B, the angle between the resultant velocity of the parachutist from the vertical line. These are the answers which you should obtain. You should get 1.9 meters per second as a resultant velocity, and the angle of the resultant velocity from the vertical should be 39 degrees. So if you found this video educational and helpful, please click like, and also subscribe for more lessons, solutions, and exam strategies from your physics teacher, Ms. Ho. If you'd like to get more information about the SPM and IGCSE physics lessons, as well as experiments, please visit my website at physicsrocks.com. Happy studying!